The reason why I say this, the Old Testament, God made a covenant with Israel and he required obedience. He gave them ten commandments and he required strict obedience. In fact, the strictest form of obedience possible. That is, they were to keep those commandments without ever breaking a single one. Now, it sounds good, but the truth of it is, it didn't, didn't last long. In fact, it lasted no longer from the moment God wrote them on the tablets to the time Moses delivered them down to the base of Mount Sinai. They were already breaking all of them. And uh, they were involved in all sorts of things down there. And so, that wasn't a mistake on God's part. God knew that that was going to be that way. So, he allows or he set up the idea of obedience unto faith. And so we're going to find out what that is. Acts chapter 5 verse 32. We are as witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them that obey him. And when people look at this, there are some who mistakenly draw the conclusion that God requires obedience to the law in order for God to impart his gifts to mankind. But, as the Bible does, New, Bible interprets Bible, Scripture interprets Scripture. So we turn to Romans 10. Turn to Romans 10. Let's look at a few things in there. Romans 10 is where it says, in verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Those two things being in every true born-again believer. The thief on the cross manifested that. He said, Lord. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. He believed that Jesus was going to rise from the dead even before he died. So he manifested those things. And we move down to um, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. In verse 16 and 17 now is where I want to draw your attention. You underline these verses. Make a note of this because somebody's going to hit you. Somebody on social media, somebody on Facebook, somebody with a YouTube video, somebody with a blog, somebody with a pamphlet of some kind is going to try to get at you and try to tell you that you need to keep the law you need, to be, you need to go back to the Old Testament. You need to do this. You need to do that. And so here, it, and God showed me this one day. I'm just, you know, okay, Lord, I, I want to know what this, you know, this word obey means. I want to understand it. Verse 16, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. There's part of your clue right there. The gospel is good tidings. That's what it means. It's not good tidings to tell people that if they make one mistake, they're doomed forever. That's bad news, but that's not good news. Okay? So, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Esaias, Isaiah, saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? We're going to go to that in a minute. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Turn to, uh, hold your place there in Romans 10. Where he says, for they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, who it, Lord, Lord, who hath believed our report? Turn to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. When you see the context of what Paul was writing here, it might help you understand a little bit. Isaiah 53. It starts out, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And then if you look in Isaiah 53. Verse, look at verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed, esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. We did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Look at verse 5. But he was wounded 
for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53 foretells the sufferings of Christ on the cross for the sins of mankind. So, when you add these two things together, Romans 10, 16, but they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report, New Testament obedience is believing what God said in His Word. We believe that according to the Word of God, we believe that Jesus died, we believe that He suffered, we believe that our sins were laid upon Him on the cross, and when he suffered and when he died, he destroyed the power of those sins over us so that death has no victory over us. Does that mean we're not going to die? No, we're going to die. Let it happen. Because when that happens, that's where our new life comes in. Turn to uh, Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, verse 8. Uh, let's, let's back up a little bit to verse six, who will render it to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, wrath, tribulation, and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentiles. If you look in, um, Galatians Let's turn to Galatians. We've got a couple places there that we're going to deal with. Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 5. Am I going too fast for you? This would be like, Megan, this would be like Bible sword drill Sunday. Just whoosh. You have an old Bible in your hand, don't you? Is that an old Bible? Is it really? I don't see the, the print, the little design on the outside of it anymore. You don't see that very much anymore. All right, that's why I said that. Anyway, Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that you should not obey the truth. There it is again. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Now, did he mean obey the law? Or did he mean obey the gospel? You look in the next verse. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Remember what Romans 10 just told us. Romans 10, 17. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So whenever the preacher, whenever the teacher, whoever it is, whenever you're reading, whenever you're listening to a message, you're listening to the Bible... You're hearing the word of God. God is building your faith and your trust in those words. He's teaching you things. Uh, somebody was talking to me uh, about when they, when they try to teach a class, like a Sunday school class, sometimes they're studying and they just run into a block and they don't get anything. I said, yeah, that, that happens. Well, how do you overcome that? Two things. Keep studying. And wait, because God always, in this need about God, God always has the ability to show up at the exact right time. Boom, there he is. Right when we, right when we need him, long past think, when we think he should have showed up, God always shows up at the right time. And what I was getting at to him was, you keep studying. And over time, the knowledge that you increase, the knowledge that you build up of the word of God, as you're studying, you'll read something and all of a sudden you'll go, I just read something related to that last week. Or I've, I've got notes on this somewhere. Or I remember a verse that, that kind of goes along with this and you use the software that we have and, and you study more about it. But over time, it's just like with anything that you do repetitively, whether it's your work or whatever, you become trained to know what this Bible says. You become trained to know that if you're reading something that it's related to something else in the Bible. And so whatever it is that you don't know now, keep reading. 
Keep studying. Keep going. Keep listening to God. Keep building your faith and your trust and your confidence in, in, this, in this Bible. When God dealt with me about the righteousness of His Word and the rightness of the Word, I accepted it, but I still had questions. And over time, God answers those questions. And I don't have those questions anymore. You've heard me talk about gray areas in our life where sometimes we're not sure if something's right. We're not sure if something's wrong. We know the Bible addresses it. We just don't know where. We don't know how. And over time, as we increase in the word, as we increase in faith, those issues and those questions of what is right and what is wrong, they diminish, those gray areas diminish, and we see things the way God sees them. We see this is right, this is wrong, this is black, this is white, and, that, and that's just how it is. It takes time, it takes labor, it takes effort, it takes a desire to want to know. Is what it does. How do you know when you're hungry? You just are. You just know you're hungry. That's your body telling you that it has need of things. And you're not, if you're not going to eat, if you, if you don't feel like eating, it's because you're not hungry. But when you get hungry for the word of God, you'll study more, you'll read more. Galatians chapter 5, turn there. Verse 7. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? There he says it again. I wonder how many times that's in the Bible. Obey the truth. Obey the truth. I've got it. Let's see here. Uh, let's see. I'm looking at Romans 2, 8, Galatians 3, 1, Galatians 5, 7, at least three times. Obey the truth. Obey the truth. Here's another one. Obeying the truth. First Peter 1. Uh, Romans 6, 17. Turn back there very quickly. I should have had you stay in Romans there for a while. Romans 6, 17. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. That's what we used to be. But you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. This is the second time now that the Bible has mentioned that your obedience and your belief must come from your heart. Must come from your heart. If you do not believe with your heart, you cannot be saved. And I don't know exactly how to explain that, but I think we all understand it. We love with our heart, don't we? We don't look at somebody or something and examine it out and rationalize it and say, okay, I will set my, I will set my, um, my affection on that simply because it is this, this way or it looks this way or, or whatever. We love somebody or something from our heart. And when you believe with your heart the the gospel when you believe with your heart the things that god said devils can't pull them back out of you can they it's just like making yourself not have an emotion devils can't devils can't take it away from you first peter chapter one turn there first peter chapter one Amen. Verse 18, we'll start there and read our way down. 1 Peter chapter 1. I hope that's not bothering you. You haven't turned all these places in the Bible because if it is, there's a lot of churches you can go to where you don't have to do that. Amen? Amen. I listened to some good preaching uh, Thursday night, Friday all day. And... Um, I heard a lot of scripture given, and that just really thrills me. That really thrills me. When I can hear preachers preach who know the Bible and who just preach verses just come out of them when they start preaching. That really blesses my heart. First Peter chapter 1, verse 18, For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver, and gold. And you know what's interesting? We don't think of silver and gold as being corruptible, do we? Gold, silver will tarnish over time. You've got to polish it. But gold doesn't. It's one of the few, um, I guess, minerals or stones or whatever 
that the purer it is, the longer it lasts, and gold will usually retain its shine. But even at that, there, to my knowledge, there is no such thing as absolute pure gold on this earth. There is no such thing. Even when it's mined, it's always mixed with something. They've got to melt it down to try to get stuff out of it. And usually when they put it into some piece of jewelry or something like that, they have to add something to it to harden it up. And so there's always the chance that gold can become cankered, I guess, or tarnished. But even at that, we're not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver or gold. And I want you to understand the value of that. It didn't cost you a dime. It didn't cost you one red penny. It did not cost you anything for you to receive eternal salvation. That price was already paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. I mentioned yesterday in the preaching, there were some of the men there that knew uh, an issue that rose up several years ago. And that is that a man wrote an article that stated that the blood of Jesus is, was not really necessary for salvation. That it really isn't the blood. And he was one of these Greek scholars. And he uh, taught Greek in a Bible college. And he said in his survey of the original Greek language, he believed that all the references to the word blood, especially in the New Testament, was a metaphor. It was just symbolic, but it didn't really mean blood. It meant death. So he wrote this long, drawn-out thing about, about how Christ's blood was no more necessary and no more divine than his spittle or his sweat or any other bodily fluid that Christ had basically said that Christ's blood was not divine blood. And what astounded me by this article that was written was that it was written by the very first pastor I ever had here at this church in 1974. The man that my mama was saved under and she loved, she loved him so much and him and his wife that when they left here, he went out to go teach at this college, teach Greek. We went out there the next spring on, summer break, on spring break to go visit them. And, um, and he just had a special place in my heart. And when I saw the article come across in an email, I looked at it, looked at who wrote it, and I thought, well, there must be some heresy about the blood in this man. Um, Brother Brown is addressing the heresy, you know, for the right. And then I found out what he said in it, and I went, no. And I went back and read it. And John MacArthur has said the same thing, that the blood is not necessary for salvation. That's a lie. If your Bible says blood, God doesn't talk funny. Amen? God doesn't say one thing and mean another. And if he does, he explains what he means in no uncertain terms. But I can tell you, having surveyed the Bible, having read verses on blood, I can tell you that if God said blood, he meant blood. And the Bible says that God, with his own blood, purchased the church. So that tells you that the blood that flowed through Christ's veins was God's own blood. And I believe it. Amen? So, you're not, you're not, you're not uh, redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. It's not corruptible. The blood, now I want you to think about this. Here's what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that Christ, as the high priest, when he ascended into heaven... He went to the most holy place of the tabernacle in heaven, the temple in heaven. And there is an ark of the covenant in heaven, God's throne. And the Bible says that Christ offered one time his blood upon the ark of the testament in heaven for the eternal redemption of mankind. So here's what I think. I think when I get to heaven and I get to see the tabernacle of God and I get to see the Ark of the Testament 
of God. I'm going to see the blood that's been, that's been sprinkled upon that Ark of the Testament. And that blood, some 2,000 years later, is going to look like it just was laid on there just now. Because it is incorruptible blood. It is everlasting. It is pure. It is divine. It is righteous. It is holy. It is without blemish. Amen. And, and there's no cancer in it. Amen. Okay. So that, that's, I mean, that's just, that's just kind of stuff I think about. It's the kind of stuff I believe. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Now, verse 22. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. There it is again. Obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Let's read a couple more verses. Being born again, not of corruptible seed. Two things that I know are incorruptible. The blood and the book. They're incorruptible. The incorruptible seed, not, uh, born, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So I just want to ask you this morning, do you believe that? Do you believe that you're saved and redeemed, not by going to mass, not by going to a church, not by performing services in the church, or doing what a minister tells you to do? You are saved, you are born again, you are redeemed by your belief and your trust in the one who is the only one who could save you. The only one who can redeem you. Not by your works of righteousness, not by your own atonement, not, certainly not by the shedding of your own blood. Uh, back in Romans, boy we should have stuck in Romans, shouldn't we? I should have put them all in order. Romans chapter 1, turn there. Romans chapter 1, let's look at verse 3. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for, and here he's going to spell it out, for the obedience to the what? What's that word? Faith. Obedience to the faith. Faith is trust. It is believing what God said among all nations for his name. Um, turn to the last chapter, Romans, chapter 16. Romans 16, look at verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. That mystery was Christ. Christ is the revelation of the mystery. He came, he was revealed to mankind being the son of God. The Roman soldier said so at the foot of the cross. Surely this man was the son of God. And so he is the revelation of the mystery, verse 26, but now is made manifest and by what? The scriptures of the prophets. Uh, that would, I guess, include all of the Old Testament. And by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for, here it, he's going to say it again, for the obedience of faith. The obedience of faith. And so, what is New Testament obedience? What is it? Believing. Believing what God said. Believing what God said in God's word. And I'm going to reiterate this. And my, my mind is full of just a lot of things I heard over the weekend. Some things that I preached yesterday. Some things that are dear, dear, dear to my heart. Is I don't doubt my Bible. 
anymore. If, if it says it, I know God meant it for a reason. Now, whether I can understand it or dissect it down or cross-reference it or whatever, whether I can do that or can't do that, to me is of no relevance anymore. And if my Bible says something, then I just automatically... It is instinctive in me now. I just absolutely just believe what my Bible says. And I have gotten away from this idea of, well, maybe it should have been better said some other way. Maybe that will make it make more sense or whatever. And I've just gotten to the point in life where if my Bible says it, then I believe it. And that's, it's over and done with. There's no argument. And I just, I mean, I don't, I don't get into hardly any, that's why I don't get on Facebook, I don't get in arguments, I don't like them, I don't like me in an argument. You wouldn't like me in an argument, okay? You wouldn't like me. I don't like me in an argument. I'm not happy with me trying to argue things with people and so on. Will I stand firm on something? Absolutely. Will I try to help somebody and give them scriptures? Yes, Absolutely. But I'm not a debater, I'm not an arguer of a case, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I would, I would, I don't know, it's just not in my nature. I, my sister drove all the fight I had at, 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 one, at one time, she drove it all out one day. That, yeah, she just beat me up, that's what it was, okay? I did, I thought, m mom used to, who ever did, who ever did, did your mom ever turn you loose with your sibling out in the backyard and say, you two go out there and fight it out and then come back in when you're done? Anybody ever had that experience? Are, are we the only ones raised right? Our mama did. She got tired of us fighting, and every now and then she'd say, you two get out in the yard, and you fight it out until you're done. I'm tired of this. And I thought, I remember one time I'm going, I'm going to do that. I sure am. I'm going to do it. I'm going to tear her up too. And every time I'd run after her, she hit me, and then she'd say, Mom, tell him stop. Mom, I'm going to hurt him. And I'd run after her again, and she'd pop me. And she'd say, Mom, Mom, get him off of me. I'm going to hurt him. And she drove all the fight out of me. Let me give you one more verse, Ephesians chapter 1. That, I guess that would be child abuse nowadays, but I don't know. But anyway, we just raised in a different time, amen? It's either that or castor oil. We got castor oil for fighting. If we fought... Mom took a tablespoon, not a teaspoon, a tablespoon, and gave us, made us swallow castor oil. Ugh. Nasty. Awful stuff. That's what we got for fighting. We tried to, we thought one day we was going to hide the bottle on her so she couldn't find it. Ephesians chapter 1, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to go sit down for a little while. Verse 10. Let's go to verse 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Do you understand what predestination means? Do you understand what it means? That God knows the outcome of your whole life. And God has also directed the outcome of your whole life. Now you ponder that. You, you, have, to, you have to have a big computer to analyze that. To write the formula out for that. Because for every, every good thing you did... God knew it. God directed the outcome of it. For every bad thing you did, God knew it. God directed the outcome of it. For every decision you made, God knew it. And God had it in His plan, in His will, in His power, in His strength. And there is nothing, and I mean absolutely nothing, outside of God's knowledge of what you did are doing and are going to do not one thing you know what the Bible says about the eyes of the Lord they're everywhere they're in every place there is not anything that God 
Does, and I read uh, Finnis Dake, which I tell you, don't do. He's a nut. He's stupid. He believed that God did not know everything that went on. That's why he had to send angels out to go gather intel and bring it back to him. That's not the same God that I worship. The, the God that I worship has his eyes in every place there is. Let me get down to verse 13. Uh, verse 12 says that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom also ye also trusted. After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. What comes first, believing or sealing? Believing does. God does not seal people who do not believe. But if people believe, if you believe once, does God know whether you're going to believe continuously or you just believed it that once, but then later you change your mind? Does God know that one too? Sure he does. God knows it all. You don't. But God knows the outcome of your life. You are sealed if God has seen the outcome of your life that you continued to believe and trust what God said. Thank God there will be no atheist, lesbian, witches in heaven. Except those who stop being atheist, lesbian, witches. And they believed and trusted in what God said. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, add your blessings to your word. We pray. We thank you, Lord, for it. Teach us, Father, to obey the truth. To obey the gospel. To believe the report that you sent down from heaven about your son, Jesus. And that this whole Bible is a revelation of Jesus Christ. Thank you for this good word. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.